You're listening to the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, I'm chatting with Amber Breeza Key about how to coach your clients more effectively for better results for them and faster business growth for you. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm your host, Laura Schoenfeld, a registered dietitian, nutrition business coach, and online entrepreneur with over 10 years of experience in online business. And I'm here to show you everything I've learned about creating a life and a business that nourishes you. On this podcast, we'll talk about the lifestyle habits, practical strategies, mindset shifts, and leaps of faith required to build a healthy body, a powerful mind, a strong spirit, and a successful business. Hey there, welcome back to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld, your host as always, and we have another great interview for you today with another one of my amazing mastermind friends, Amber Brzezicki. And this is one of the last episodes we have that is batched before the end of my maternity leave. So by the time you're listening to this, I should be wrapping things up and getting back into business, which is exciting and a little scary, even on this side of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, But I'm so excited to have Amber with us today because she has a really, really inspiring business. Um, I've been following Amber's journey since I first heard her on our mutual coach, James Wedmore's podcast back in 2019. And now that I'm in the mastermind with her, getting to see what she's accomplishing in her business, selling a $300 macros training program for the general public is really, really incredible. And one of the things that makes her business work so well and her program sell so well is her commitment to becoming the best coach possible. So that's really what we're talking about today. We're going to be discussing how your coaching skills not only can help your clients get better results, but it can also help you grow your business, which I know a lot of you are entrepreneurs here and you want to grow your business. You want to be more effective at helping people. And that's exactly what we're going to help you with today. So Amber Brzezicki is a wife, mom of four, and former registered nurse who founded Biceps After Babies because she believes that being a mom doesn't mean that your fittest days are behind you. What started as a little Instagram account to share her fitness journey online has since become a business focused on empowering women to achieve more. Her signature coaching program, Macros 101, has helped over 5,000 women use the tool of macro counting to build a nutrition plan that's both effective and enjoyable. Amber also created a transformational fitness coach certification that teaches other health and fitness coaches how to improve client results by getting to the root of their problems. Amber loves chocolate and peanut butter, preferably together, lifting heavy weights at CrossFit and hanging out at the beach with her family. So we're really going to be focusing on how to be a better coach in this conversation today. And I know I learned a lot through the conversation and I bet you will too. So without further ado, here is Amber Brzezicki. All right, everyone. Well, I am so excited to have with us on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Amber Brzezicki. Welcome to the show, Amber. Hey, Laura. I'm so excited to be here. I was very nervous. I was about to mess your name up, even though I've said it it a dozen times, probably (laughs) in the last like two months. But I'm constantly telling my students about Amber because she just runs this amazing business and it's very inspiring. And I was telling Amber before we hit record that um, anytime somebody's asking about pricing and it's like, well, I don't want to go too low. I'm like, Let's see what my friend Amber was able to do with (laughs) when she dropped her prices. So that's a story for another day. Um, But all I was going to say is that uh, I know you have a lot of really awesome things going on in your business and you work with lots of different types of people between helping clients with nutrition and macros and fitness and all of that and also serving professionals that want to coach. So we're going to talk more about the coaching side of things today if people are interested in learning more about Amber's macro uh, approach and how she helps people with that. She has her own podcast and lots of content, I'm sure, on that topic. So content on they can go check that out. But um, let's talk a little bit about first, how did you get into this world of online nutrition and and, uh, health coaching? 
Yeah. Accidentally is the, is the answer <laughs> to that question. Dropped, dropped from a helicopter. <laughs> accidentally. Um, so I actually went to school for nursing, um, got my bachelor of science in nursing and worked as a nurse in a neurosurgical critical care unit for um, a couple of years. And this was while my husband was actually in medical school. So um, we're super cute. We're like doctor and nurse and you know, it's super cute, but he went through med school and I put him through med school while working. And when he went to residency, by that point we had two kids and, um, you know, residency hours are crazy. It's like 80 hour work weeks. He like, didn't come home until like 10, 11 o'clock at night and worked all weekends. And so where he had a very predictable schedule during med school, and I was able to work my, my nursing schedule around him. Once we went to residency, that just became, just wasn't even an option. Um, and I had two kids by that point. And so it was like, by the time you're paying for daycare, it just really didn't make financial sense for me to continue doing nursing. And so, um, I, you know, took a leave from, from nursing and, and decided, you know what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to get, I'm going to teach fitness classes. Um, because that's what my mom did growing up. I'm, I'm one of seven and my mom for all I can remember taught fitness classes at the YMCA, like old school aerobics. And I just remember growing up and going to the YMCA and like watching my mom teach fitness classes. And so, I, I knew that that was something that obviously could work really well with a mom's schedule. And I had these two little babies and I needed just to get out of the house and I needed to exercise anyways. So why not get paid to do it? And so, you know, that's, that's really where I kind of got started in the fitness industry was just teaching group fitness classes. And I did that for, for eight years and, um, loved it, loved the people, loved the community, loved being able to drop my kids off for a couple of hours. Um, cause now I have four. So like we kept adding so that number kept growing and, um, in 2016, I, I just, I had this realization as I was rolling into making my new year's resolutions that I had been teaching fitness classes for like eight years and nothing really ever changed with my body. It was like always very, very similar. It was like, I always kind of just looked the same and I was putting in lots and lots of hours at the gym. I was like, that's not it. So that's, that's not the missing piece. And I really realized that what I hadn't been paying attention at all to was my nutrition. And, um, I had stumbled across a Pinterest link of a girl talking about macro counting back then it was called like IIFYM and <laughs> wasn't, it wasn't super mainstream at the time. It was really just kind of coming over from the bodybuilding industry to more like general population. And, but I read through it and I was like, okay, so this scientifically makes sense. You know, coming from my like nursing science background, I was like, okay, this, this is different than like some of these other like fad diets. I'm like, science behind this actually makes sense. Like I get this and um, I'm gonna try it out. I'm going to test it out. And so I did, I, I set a goal in 2016. My new year's resolution was to get a six pack. And, um, I was like, I'm going to try this, this macro counting thing. Lo and behold, I changed my nutrition and like focused on it for, you know, eight, 10 weeks. And like my body just responded super well. And I, and I got that six pack that I wanted. And I was like, crazy. This was, it was insane to me how fast my body responded when I started to fuel it pro appropriately for the goals that I was trying to hit. And so I just started sharing on Instagram, just kind of sharing my story. Like, here's what I'm doing. Like, here's what was working. Here's, you know, how I'm counting macros and oh my gosh, like people just kind of came out of the woodwork and started following me. And I started getting DMs saying, Hey, will you coach me? Will you teach me how to do this? And I was like, sure. That sounds fun. Let's let's do that. <laughs> and so that's how it was born. It was like people literally just asking me to coach them and, um, me saying yes. And it developed into a business. And here we are, you know, seven years later and a team and a brand and nothing I ever thought I would do, but that I have loved, loved so incredibly much. Yeah. Well, I have followed your story since do you remember what year you were on James's podcast? Was it 2019? Probably was 2019. 2019. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I remember hearing that episode, which gosh, that was what, three years ago now? That, That's crazy. That would have, I feel like there's probably been a lot of changes in your oh, business. Yeah. And so much. Um, I just remember being really inspired by that and just thinking like what is possible when you're really consistent with your message and your focus. And how many times have you launched Macros oh, 101 like at this 15. point? 15. I think yeah. we just had our 15th launch. That's amazing. Of the same program so, over yeah. and over and over again. Which before we hit record, we were talking about how that's like not on autopilot in the sense that you don't do anything for it. It's not evergreen or anything mm -hmm. as far as I know, but, um, but just the rinse and repeat cycle of launching has allowed you to become like, we know exactly what we're doing. We know exactly what we're talking about. And I feel like 
It's so funny because I, I think a lot of business owners are like, well, aren't I going to get bored doing the same thing over and over? And I just look at you and I'm like, Amber's business is like the business you want where everything's for the most part figured out. I know you have like mm-hmm. challenges and stuff that comes up, but it's, you're not reinventing the wheel and you're not doing a new thing all the time. You're just perfecting the process that you already have. So yeah. And I get to spend my time doing what I love doing in macros one now, you know, it's like, I'm not building registration pages. I'm not like working on, I don't know, like webinars or things like that. Like I have all that stuff dialed in. Like that's the content's Mm -hmm. created. Like everything's created. So when I get to show up, it's like doing the things I love to do that light me up, like coaching and teaching. Mm -hmm. And like, I just have a blast launching because it's like, I don't have to do any of the, I don't do any of the tech. I don't do any of the like customer service emails. Like I show up, I do what I'm good at. I teach, I connect with people and And you know, that's, that's why it's not boring is like, yeah, it's the same thing, but like, I I also get better at it. I get better at teaching it. I get better at communicating and Mm -hmm. being able to see people go through a transformation. Like that doesn't, that doesn't ever get boring. Yeah. Well, and that leads us to our topic of the day, which is coaching and getting better at coaching and being able to coach your clients, particularly through self-sabotage. So, um, did you do any formal training to become a coach with, with the business or did you kind of just like fall into it and then start learning on your own? Yeah. So, I mean, so like I said, it was very organic starting was like, I was doing it. I was getting results with my body. People saw that and they were like, okay, cool. Can you coach me? And I think it's a really good topic to bring up because I think a lot of times, uh, there is an assumption made that if somebody is able to get a result in their own business, with their own body, with their own kids, whatever, that that immediately makes them a really good coach to be able to help other people. And those are completely different strengths. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. you being able to get a result in your life is valuable and awesome and amazing. And then there's a different set of skills that needs to be (laughs) obtained in order to be really good at getting other people to obtain the same, the same, Mm -hmm. um, results. And so I I learned that pretty quickly. Um, actually, as I started coaching clients and I was, you know, telling them all these things to do, like, I know how to do this. I've done it now. Now you just do it. Like, I'm just going to give you your macros and I'm going to give you like your workouts and you just like go and do them. And then like, bada bing, bada bing, bada boom, like (laughs) six pack in eight weeks, (laughs) six packs in eight weeks. And like, (laughs) and I very quickly started noticing that like, it, you know, no matter how amazing the macros were that I gave somebody or no, no matter how amazing these workouts and how like specific and customized they were to this client, like they didn't always do it mm-hmm. and, uh, and, or they would do it and it wouldn't get the same result. And like, there was a lot more troubleshooting than I, I had expected early on. Um, and, and so I kept kind of scratching my head is like, why can I understand the science, right? I'm all about the science and understanding the nutrition and and doing this, but I can give the same plan to a couple of different people and they get vastly different results. Like what's going on here and how as a coach, am I going to address that? Um, and a lot of people, a lot of coaches don't address that. They kind of just say like, here's, here's the plan, do it. If you do it, well then awesome. I'm going to use you as a testimonial. And then if you don't do it, then, well, you didn't do the plan. So you go off and don't talk to anybody. Oh. <laughs> don't tell anybody about NDA. <laughs> yeah. NDA, <laughs> right? Like, like, and, and a little bit of like, victim blaming too, as well as like, well, I gave you this amazing plan and you didn't do it. So, well, that's on you, right? Mm -hmm. That's your responsibility. And, um, and you know, we can talk about responsibilities of clients versus coaching and there definitely is a separation there, but I realized very early on that I wanted to be the type of coach that could actually coach the hard clients. Initially in my business, I was like, I only want to take the really easy clients, like the clients who have never dieted before (laughs) clients who just like lack the knowledge. And when I give them the knowledge about macros, they like are able to take it and run with it and get a six pack in eight weeks. Like those are fun clients. Those are easy clients. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't really like having the hard clients. And I got to this point. I was like, no, I want to, I want to figure out the hard clients. I want to figure out the clients who have been dieting forever. And I want to figure out the clients who, um, you know, every weekend they go off the rails and start restart on Monday. Like I want to figure out those clients. Um, and so to answer your question, cause you asked about like formal training, a lot of that came from just trial and erring. Um, it also came from getting coached myself and seeing different styles of coaching and, and kind of creating an amalgamation of those different, you know, a little bit of like my nursing and and scientific training, a little bit of like user error and testing and trying and testing things with other clients. And then a little bit of, of getting coached myself and seeing what was really effective in terms of coaching styles 
and kind of putting that all together and being able to create a methodology that now I teach other, other coaches to be able to dig deep with the clients. And instead of just saying, oh, well, you didn't follow the plan. That's on you. Be able to dig deep and hold that, that client's hand and figure out why they didn't follow the plan and how you're going to be on their side and be their partner in helping them to move through that. Mm-hmm. I don't know why this just came to mind, but it makes me think about why your business is so successful. And you were saying how you would, you know, in the beginning prefer to work with people that just needed the information and they were off and yeah. running. And I do wonder, cause I, I don't, I, I guess you said you started your business in 2016. Was mm-hmm. that? Yeah. yeah. So I've been in the online space running my own business and working on another business for over 10 years now. And I feel like there's enough information on the internet that I'm not even sure you can really sell very well to people that just need information. Totally. Yeah. Right. Like, Agreed. Yeah. I actually feel like if somebody just needs information, the likelihood that YouTube. they're going to spend. Right. <laughs> or <laughs> Google. <YouTube. laughs> right. There is so much free content online these days for all topics, right? Not just nutrition, but nutrition especially. And I do think that the skill of helping people take action and get outcomes is actually what creates like 90% of the value in your service. Like there is going to be some, um, you know, that, that knowledge and applying the knowledge, right. Cause I think sometimes you can have a lot of information, but knowing how to apply it to your own self is hard. And so, you know, helping somebody apply it in a uh, customized or personalized way is very valuable. Um, but if you're, if you're thinking you're going to be a nutrition expert or a health coach or whatever kind of health business owner, and your job is just to give good information and the person will go off and get these results or that even that the information is what they're paying for. I feel like that doesn't work anymore in our, in our field. Right. Yeah. And so I was just thinking about how that's probably a big reason why your business has been so successful is because you've done that hard work to learn how to coach the people who do struggle or have tried and failed before, because those are the people who are willing to invest in coaching because if it was just a matter of getting information, again, the internet is full of information and there's plenty available and they don't necessarily need to pay somebody for information. Yeah. Well, and here's another thing that I noticed too, um, especially with nutrition professionals is that I know you talk a lot to RDs is like, you guys are smart. Like you guys know your crap. Like, you know, the science, you know, the like evidence-based nutrition, like, you know, all that you've read all the research studies, like, you know, all that. And yet, uh, if you don't address the issue that this person has likely heard conflicting information from somebody else before, and like, why should they believe you? And just because you're telling somebody that this is like the evidence and this is supported, um, I get it all the time where people are like, yeah, but like, I've heard so many people, so many professionals say so many different things. It's like, Mm -hmm. who the heck am I supposed to believe? And if you think just because they're investing in you, they're going to believe every single thing that comes out of your mouth you have another thing coming and we as professionals have to be able to, yes, give good, solid, scientifically based recommendations and be able to back it up with helping the client to overcome those mental blocks that prevent them from accepting that, that scientific information and use, mm-hmm. using it in their own journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, even with working with business co- or business owners, people who, you know, they're, they have their nutrition degree and they've started a business. So they're the kind of people that you would imagine are very, you know, self-starters, action takers, that kind of thing. And it's, there is still that theme of the information's not enough. Like I can put together this whole start to finish how to training on how to do something and half the group might go do it and take action and the other half might not. And it's just really interesting to see, um, you know, even in people who have accomplished a lot and are very intelligent and have, you know, obviously a lot of self-control because you don't get through, you know, dietetics program or something like, you know, you don't start a business if you just have no, uh, action oriented focus. But, um, but there's always that point where people hit where it's like suddenly now they're not able to, to get past a block or a plateau or something. And, um, that's been an area that we've, as a team, and we've brought in a guest experts to talk about that with our group, because it's like, I can give you the best information in the world, but if there's something that's stopping you from taking action on it for any reason, then that's, it doesn't matter how good the information is. And I know you run into the same stuff with your, yep. your macros group. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's like, if, 
I can tell you to do push-ups because push-ups are the best movement in the whole world. But if somebody, some, you know, down the line told you that if you do push-ups, they're going to make your boobs smaller. Like you might not do the push-ups. <laughs> it's like that, but that kind of stuff is like, I didn't realize that as a, as a beginning coach, I just think, oh, I'll just tell someone to do the push-ups. Mm-hmm. Easy peasy. Just do the push-ups, like do this mm-hmm. many reps and this many sets. But until you start to realize that, oh my gosh, like there's so much programming that goes into this person that has happened before you ever like started telling them to do pushups. And if I wasn't able to, to address that as a coach, I was failing my clients on some level mm-hmm. and, and that didn't feel great to me. And so I really was like, I'm going to figure this out. Cause that's the kind of person I am. I was like, I'm going to figure this out. What is, what is the key to helping clients to actually do the things that they know they need to do? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's kind of that idea of self-sabotage, right? Where you know what to do. You have the tools and the resources and the information that you need and you either don't do it at all or you start to do it and then stop. So what do you, from your experience working with thousands of people at this point, and I know, again, you have this um, coaching training program that you now teach other people how to coach more effectively. Where do you feel like that comes from? Because I know as a coach myself, that's one of my biggest frustrations when I see that happening with a student where it's like they, they make an excuse or something is just like in their way saying, I can't do this. I can't take action on this. And the reality is that actually you can, like it's literally possible. (laughs) There's nothing stopping you. So what do you, what do you feel like is at the root of that for most people? Yeah. So, so I think this is, this brings up a really interesting conversation because I think it, it, highlights something in the, in the coaching industry that, um, is a reason that people stay stuck in these cycles. And, and you, you nailed it when you said like, that's how I define self-sabotage when you know what to do, but you don't do it. And it tends to be this, like, feel like there's a devil on one side, the angel on the other. And it's like, I'm fighting against myself. And, you know, in the end the devil wins and I eat all the cake. And then I have to like start over. And so that's, that, this is this idea of self-sabotage. And, um, what, what typically happens is in the coaching industry is we really address the symptoms of self-sabotage. So for example, the example that I just gave of like, I'm super good tracking my macros Monday through Friday, but then Friday hits and then I go off the rails and I like eat all the things and don't track anything over the weekend. And then Monday comes and I like have to restart again. And we see that as coaches. And what tends to happen is we address that that symptom, that symptom of like, Oh, like, okay. So how do we get you to stay on your macros over the weekend? And so we come up with all these strategies and all these ideas of like, let's, let's try this out. Like, let's have you do this. Let's have you try this out. And, um, and then, you know, maybe it works for a little bit or maybe it doesn't, but the problem is, is that it never gets to the root of like where that self-sabotage is coming from. And so I think of, um, I often use the metaphor of a tree where we can see the, the tree, we can see the leaves and the flowers of the tree. And then we see the trunk of the tree. And then what we can't see is the roots of the tree. And those, those flowers, those leaves are like the results that somebody is getting. So the weight that they've lost, the transformation, the physical transformation that they've had, you know, and that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants the physical transformation. I want to be able to see it in the mirror. I want to be able to see it on the scale and have that physical transformation. And we all know that results are created by actions, you know, so you track your macros and you go to the gym and you mail prep and whatever, all these actions that you're doing are going to yield you those, those results. And we, and we all know on some level in order to get new results, I have to take new actions. And so that is where so many of us focus is right on that action piece. Um, and, and we spend a lot of time there. What should I eat? How should I work out? What are the, like the best supplements? Like what are these the actions that I should do to, to produce this new result? But what a lot of people start to miss is that those actions don't just come out of thin air. They come from somewhere and that's where the roots are. And that becomes the beliefs. That becomes the stories we're telling ourselves. That becomes that that past history of your mom, like telling you that you weighed too much when you were 13 years old. And now you've had a complex about it for the rest of your life is like all of these things below the surface. And so if we're only addressing the actions, right? Oh, you stopped tracking your macros or, oh, you didn't go to the gym or, oh, you, you know, I don't know, whatever you ate, you ate three slices of cake. If we only focus on those actions, we are missing the underlying root cause. We're missing what's actually creating that. And we aren't able to actually solve it because we aren't going to the actual root cause. You know, I think about it with like my husband's a physician and, um, if someone has a headache, yeah, we can give them ibuprofen and like, maybe that'll take their headache away. 
And maybe it was just random and it wasn't a big deal. But if like that headache's caused by a brain tumor, just giving someone ibuprofen isn't actually going to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so if we can get down to the root and we can get down to like what's actually creating, I know you talk about this a lot, right? But like functional nutrition, right? It's like, if we can get down to the root of it and solve that, well, now we don't have to sit there and worry about like, well, why aren't you sticking to your macros over the weekend? Because Mm -hmm. we've solved the underlying issue of why you weren't doing it in the first place. Yeah. Well, and that's really interesting. You bring up the the functional nutrition side of things because I I think it's that approach takes a root cause uh, mindset, but yeah. a lot of times it's looking at the roots of the issue from like a a physical perspective, mm-hmm. right? So you know if you have skin problems and it turns out you have a gut infection, then going after what's in the gut is gonna hopefully fix the skin issue, right? So mm-hmm. it's um in that space, dietitians and health professionals already have that idea of looking below the surface. But I, I think one of the things we've tended to miss, not everybody, but having been in this space for a long time, I've seen it where they're just looking at, okay, what are the physical things that need fixed to get that result? And they're not necessarily thinking about the person as a human that like, even if you give them a supplement protocol or diet changes or, you know, lifestyle habits to implement that, you know, if they do those things, will get to the root issue and then create the outcome that they're looking for. That doesn't mean they're going to do it. Right. So it's interesting that I feel like in the functional medicine space, a lot of providers are really good at looking at the, what's like really causing this from a physical perspective, but they don't always look at it from a mental or psychological perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and on that same note, um, most people, uh, most lay people would be like, I don't even get the connection between my gut and my face. Like, no, no, fix my face. Like <laughs> fix, <laughs> fix like the skin issues. And you're like, but I am, but I am like when we fix your gut, that's going to fix. And you as the professional kind of have to explain that connection between mm-hmm. the two, because it's not apparent. It's kind of counterintuitive of why fixing your gut may fix your skin. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same thing with, um, with coaching. One of the root causes that I see a lot with clients is all or nothing mentality. And it's always funny when I put up anything about all or nothing thinking, like put up a post on Instagram or put up all the things like everybody like double traps that crap, but nobody (laughs) is, but people are really terrible at actually looking inside and seeing where they do that constantly all the time. And so I, I bring this up to my clients, you know, we'll start digging in and, and kind of looking for like, well, where is this coming from? And, and sometimes it's, it's all or nothing thinking and I'll point it out to them. And they are just like flabbergasted because they, they're like, yes, I get it in concept all or mm-hmm. nothing thinking bad. I don't do that. That's terrible. I can't even imagine why anybody would do that. That's so stupid. And then I point it out to them and they're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I didn't realize that was there. I didn't realize this link between something, this like thing I tapped on Instagram and and actually my binging over the weekend or, or Mm -hmm. whatever it may be. And, and, and that's part of this idea of like, just because you know something cognitively, just like, just you've heard of the all or nothing thinking doesn't mean you're always able to see it in yourself Mm -hmm. when it's present. Yeah. Well, and working with health professionals, they can see it in their clients when their clients are doing it, but then it's easier when when you're not the person. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and that's, I mean, side note, that's why Amber and I, I'm sure I can, well, I don't want to speak for Amber, but I'm guessing one of the reasons that you hire coaches is because you understand that you're, you can't see everything yourself. We have have blind spots. We all have blind spots. Right. And it's, I always use the analogy of like spinach in your teeth. It's like, you have spinach in your teeth, you can't see it. So how do you get it out? Like either you look in a mirror or you have a friend lean over and like, tell you you have your spinach in your teeth, but you can't see it yourself. Mm -hmm. But once somebody says, Hey girlfriend, you got some spinach in your teeth. You're like, Oh, let's get rid of that. Mm -hmm. We can get that out. But it takes somebody else outside of you to be able to say, Hey, check that out. Yeah. Let's take a look at that. And then, and then you can start to remove it. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I will ever not invest in coaching because I will never get rid of all of my blind spots. Mm-hmm. Well, those okay. blind- None of all of us <laughs> have blind and spots. Those, those blind spots change when yes. you grow, right? So oh like something that's a blind spot five years ago is probably different now, but you know, that's oh. why we, yeah. we hire coaches that are ahead of us, right? Because it's like, you could probably see what I'm doing that's stopping me from getting to this next level. Yeah. So, yep. um, so how, walk me through how you might address this, especially, I was just thinking, especially in a group setting, because 
you don't do any one-on-one for no. macros, right? I was no. going to say, probably not with the size of the group you no. have. No. So do you, is it a different approach when you're working with a group versus a one-on-one clients? So you used to do one-on-one and I don't know if mm-hmm. you do any one-on-one at all anymore, but I don't know if mm-hmm. um, that's something you address when you work with the coaches that you're training, if there's a different strategy or if it's exactly the same and, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, the number of root causes that there is to um, self-sabotage, you could probably put it in like five to six different categories. And now they're nuanced and they show up a little differently and, and they kind of impact people differently. But if I'm just putting them to like general categories, there's like five or six of them. And so um, when I'm coaching in a group setting, if we're addressing one of those five categories, it's going to resonate with a lot of other people. And mm-hmm. so I found, I actually, I actually, in a lot of ways, prefer and actually feel like clients get better results when I do group stuff instead of one-to-one. Um, and for a lot of years, and I kind of had to like train my clients this way as well is because I think for a lot of times we're like, Oh, one-to-one is the best. It's like, that's the peak. We pay the most for one-to-one. And I actually find that my clients get better results in a group. And I think one of the reasons that is, is because, um, it's easier to see things in other people it's hard to see it in yourself. And even when there's somebody who's coaching you to help you see it in yourself, oftentimes I will see clients can spot it when they're listening to other people get coached and it allows them to see it more directly in themselves. They Mm -hmm. can listen to somebody else get coached and be like, girlfriend, like, just like, just like do the reverse, like just do it. And then they're like, Oh my God, (laughs) like try to like shine that light back on them. And they have this Mm -hmm. realization. So, um, and then I also think it's really valuable Um, one thing that happened a lot with me when I was doing one-on-one clients is we'd get to the end of the six, eight or 12 weeks and I'd be like, okay, what questions do you have? Like, as we're wrapping up, like what questions do you have? And they're like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what I don't know. (laughs) It's like, you can't ask questions about what you may have something happen in the future or that you don't know that you don't know at this point. And so it's one of the reasons I love a group setting is because, um, people ask questions and nine times out of 10, there'll be people on the call who are like, oh my gosh, I wouldn't even have thought to answer that question. But now that I have the answer, oh, like my mind is blown. Um, so to answer your question, is it different in a group setting versus one-to-one? No, it's actually, it's actually exactly the same. The same way that I would coach someone on a one-to-one call uh, is exactly how I would coach. You know, I, to me, group is essentially one-to-one with other people watching. It's, it's the same, it's the same, um, same plan, same path, same questions that I'm asking. It just, mm-hmm. other people get to experience it alongside of them. And I love, I love group coaching for that, for that reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've had that experience too, in our programs where people wouldn't necessarily think to ask a question or maybe aren't comfortable asking a question right. and somebody else asks it and you're like, oh my gosh, I just learned so much from that. And, and I agree there is that <sighs> sad, but, uh, un- it's just an unfortunate situation where people, I think, look at group coaching as being not very valuable right. sometimes, not all the time. Um, I do wonder if some of that is because people join group programs and have a mediocre experience um, and then yeah, <laughs> and then are like, that sucked. I don't want to do that again. And then they don't yeah. trust your your group coaching abilities. But, um, but I digress. Yeah, sure. I just, I, I do, I want people who are listening to understand that these tools are things that if you're going to do a group program, which a lot of my clients want to, because they want to have that scalable income, maybe they Mm -hmm. don't want to do one-on-one anymore. Um, being able to take action on this stuff is especially important for a group program because you have to be able to get at this stuff without being able to talk to everybody, right? Like if you're going to get results or help get results for a large group, And you can't have a one-on-one, like, you know, fixing all the problems as they come up for each individual, then I think these skills are even more important so that the the group can actually get the results that they were wanting when they joined. Yes. And one thing that's important to note is that the symptoms, the actions are like so varied, right? There can be like tons and tons of different manifestations but like I said, there's really like five to six root causes. Mm-hmm. And so that, that helps to, to, to bridge that gap of understanding of like why people sometimes think it's hard to coach, um, a group because there's like all of these different situations and scenarios. And like every single one of them is, is so unique. And how could I coach one of these and have it apply to this 
completely different scenario. And you're right. If you're only coaching the actions, it, it doesn't really apply. But when you realize that the underlying root cause that there's like five or six of them, and we're always going down to the root cause, then now that immediately starts to apply to more people. Because even though the manifest their manifestation looks a little bit different, that root cause is still the same. And if we can address that, then we can serve, you know, half of the population who's in that group mm-hmm. at that one time. And then the next client, we're going to serve the other half of the population. Yeah. Now, do you teach those root causes to your customers so that they know when you're talking about them, what you're talking about, or is it just like for your yes. own reference? No. Yes, I do teach them. But again, everybody learns about it and they're like, oh, that's so interesting. I, I don't do that. And then I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> and then I show it to them and they're like, oh my gosh, I do do that. So yeah, I teach the causes, but it still is, even if you know to look for it, it's still, it's very sneaky in the way that it manifests for a lot of us. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, I teach it to them, but most people still need help in identifying that, oh, you're right. I do actually struggle with fear of failure or mm-hmm. fear of success or all or nothing thinking, you know, some of these, these basic things that people nod, nod their heads to, but don't yeah. Or have a hard time applying and see it in themselves. Yeah. Or at least, you know, they come up with reasons why, well, that's not applicable in my situation because my situation is an actual real problem and these like themes are not relevant to the thing I'm dealing with. Yep. So how do you get at this stuff in like a, because you're just for people's context, you have thousands of people in your program, right? Yeah. So you know, I have clients who are like freaked out by running a 20 person group program and Amber is there with, you know, 1500 or something, people Mm -hmm. joining, joining around. Um, how do you approach your coaching calls with a group like that? Is it just like a free for all ask your questions and whoever gets picked gets picked? Or is there like a method to that? What, what do you do? Yeah. So I think, um, and you know, I honestly learned this a lot from, from James and just watching him is, um, you know, as your groups get bigger, I think you have to be more intentional about, um, applying things to everybody and really, and really calling it out, like specifically calling it out of, of making sure that when, when I'm speaking to one person, I am speaking to, you know, Jenna, but I'm talking to everybody in this room or everybody Mm -hmm. who's listening to this call. And, and so I really call that out. So, you know, from a like logistical standpoint, yeah, we, we have, we run our, our calls on like webinars because they're that big. You know, it's like, we don't even use zoom meeting anymore. It's like we're on zoom webinars because they're big. Um, and people can request a hot seat. We ask people to like raise their hand and request a hot seat with a question. Um, one of the things that I have started doing is I have had clients, this is like a little, little side tip that you guys can use for your guys's, um, group calls Mm -hmm. is I, at the very beginning of the call, if I have um, clients write down their question, like, what is your question? If you and I were going to sit down, we were going to hang out, we were going to like have a coaching session together. What question would you ask me? Write it down. And then we ask for hot seats and we go through the whole, whole entire coaching call. And at the end of the coaching call, I say, look at your question. Did your question get answered? It's either a yes or no. Like, yes, it got answered. Cool. Awesome. No, it didn't get answered. Okay, cool. Now your job is to go into our our community and post that question so that we can get it answered for you. Right. So it's, it's creating this responsibility on the client of like, yeah, a lot of these questions are going to get answered in the call, but some of them aren't. And now it's your responsibility to go and get them answered because you mm-hmm. deserve to have an answer to your question. We didn't have enough time here to be able to get to everybody, but you deserve to have an answer. So go ask in our community and, and it will get answered there. Um, so I, I've been doing that and I really like that because it, it again, puts that responsibility on the client to make sure that, they're getting their questions answered and that they're taking an active approach and not just sitting back and being like, well, she didn't answer my question. Well, yeah. Okay. I'm not, not can't answer every question, but you have a responsibility to get it answered. Mm-hmm. Um, so we run hot seat style. We do as many as possible. And, um, you know, nine times out of 10, there's not a ton of questions that come after a call, which lets me know, okay, we did a really good job of like meeting people where they're at, mm-hmm. um, and coaching them. The other thing that I think is really important, especially as you start running group programs, and I make this really clear to my, to my clients because we do have a limited time. Like I work with my clients, it's an eight week program. So that freaks some people out. Cause they're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do after the eight weeks? And I make the point that I embed a lot of coaching into my teaching. So I've gotten a lot better as I've become a better coach to learn how to teach 
in a way that simultaneously coaches them through it. And the, mm-hmm. and, you know, speaking to more like business stuff, the more I've in, like intimately started to know my avatar and really know what she's thinking and what she struggles with. And when I say this, she's going to think this. So then I can coach her through that on the lesson, because I know mm-hmm. that once I start talking about reverse dieting, oh my gosh, you guys are going to freak out because you don't want to eat more calories. You don't want to gain more fat. And like, you're going to have this whole thing in your head. I can uh, literally coach you through that on a pre-recorded lesson because mm-hmm. I know my avatar. I know what she's thinking and feeling. And so I've embedded a lot of coaching into my actual teaching mm-hmm. um, as well. Which is the reason that we select a niche, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you get to know, you know, your avatar and what they struggle with and what they think. Mm-hmm. Um, I always thought that like was this is like showing my ignorance. It's like, I always thought it was really dumb. It's like, oh, it's so dumb. It's like ICA stuff. Like, why do we have to, why do we have to like do this? It's so stupid. Yeah. And the further I've gotten into the business, the more I've realized my business has grown with the ability that I have to get into my clients' heads. The better mm-hmm. I am at getting in my clients' heads. And that just is like knowing them, yeah. knowing what they're thinking, listening to them, hearing their complaints, hearing their problems, hearing their struggles, hearing their like things that they're telling themselves and being able to repeat it back to them. My business has grown to the level at which I understand my, my client avatar. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine, because I've had this experience, it's a lot easier to run your business the more oh. you get to know your ideal clients. So much. Because yeah. writing content and marketing materials and doing launches and creating programs, all that is, I'm sure, so much easier when you don't have to try to guess like what might people think Mm -hmm. about this because I have like 500 different types of people that could be in this program, right? So um, so not to go on a tangent, but I do think sometimes when people are resisting that that niching thing because they're like, I'm going to get bored or, you know, I just have so many passions and I want to talk about all this stuff. It's like, well, you're literally making your business harder to run by keeping things really broad. And and I've been there. Like, that's one of the reasons why I had a program that I shut down that actually had the same name as this podcast, because it was like, I was just trying to like help everybody with everything and just have it be this like super comprehensive, amazing resource that people would get. And the people that were in it loved it. So it was like, you know, a little bit of positive reinforcement there (laughs) that the people who were doing it were like, this is amazing. I love this content. But then when I went to sell it, it was like total crickets. And, um, you know, that was one of the things that I, that experience really guides how I approach my current business because I don't ever want to have that experience again, where I put all this time and energy and effort into creating something that nobody really wants. Cause it's Mm -hmm. like literally one of the worst feelings in the world where you're Mm -hmm. like, this is amazing. And it's like my life's work and nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Right. So I do think, um, whether it's being able to coach more effectively, being able to sell more effectively, being able to understand what kind of questions and challenges and concerns come up for your typical client is really, really helpful. And I'm sure that helps make coaching easier when you're like, Oh, I've heard this, (laughs) heard this one many a time. Definitely know how to coach through this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I share one? Um, like it's like a piece of advice that James gave me that like rocked my world. Yeah. I always into that. <laughs> he told me and like this, it's like still like blows my mind. It's so good. He told me, he's like, so often we create the program and then create the marketing to market the program. He's like, magic happens when you do it the other way around, when you create the marketing first and then create the content off of the marketing, when you create the messaging, when you create, like, what is the gap? What is the demand and desire? Like, how are we, what, like, what does that look like? And then from there, create the program. Now, now you don't have that problem of what so many people have is where they create this amazing programming. And then they go to like, try and market it and they can't figure out the angle or the way that they're going to sell it or the way that it's going to speak to people. And uh, if you do it backwards, you, you save yourself a lot of time and trouble. And when he said that, I was like, that's genius. I like, I never thought of doing it that way before, but it makes a mm-hmm. lot of sense because the messaging is so important to, to selling your stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, and I mean, it makes sense because usually we're not spending money on things that we don't even know what they are. Right. 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 And that, that was my problem with that original program is that people were like, this sounds cool, but what is it? Right. And so, um, I've been really into the concept of the program promise recently because it's like, 
if we can't narrow that down into a very specific thing that you can say in like one sentence, Mm -hmm. then everything else is going to be hard. It's going to be hard to sell it. It's going to be hard to run it. Because even what we were saying here, Amber's program is very, very specific about what is the outcome that people want and what is the methodology, right? And so having that clarity then I think really narrows the spectrum of challenges that people are going to run into because it's like, you're not trying to solve 50 different problems, right? You have one core problem. And that doesn't mean that there aren't some like ancillary problems, especially in the health world. Like there's always some stuff that, you know, can affect people's results that isn't specifically related to what you're teaching. But it is something where the more narrow you get, you just get more depth and more focus on even the troubleshooting side of things and the coaching and the support piece. And I've definitely found that to be true where coaching calls are a lot less stressful when you're like, I generally know what we're going to be talking about today. And it's not going to be this like crazy left field. What are, you know, this is not even in the scope of this program kind of (laughs) question. So, um, not that we want to, uh, belabor the point around niching, but I do think if people are struggling with the idea of coaching in a group, that might be a symptom to look for. Like, are you, is your program too broad and trying to help people in a group setting is actually not even going to work because they all have completely different questions that don't have anything to do with each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's like if if you're in a group with like one person who's trying to build a business, one person who's trying to lose weight and one person who's trying to walk a dog, like, yeah, that's really hard to coach in a group setting. (laughs) Like they just are. So that's why the more specific you can get and the more niche down you can get. Now you're dealing with all very similar problems. Mm -hmm. Um, and now when we do group coaching, it's going to be much more applicable to a wider audience because, it's all, all kind of boils down to some of the same issues. Yeah. Do- whether it's a dog or a business or health. Yeah. Hopefully nobody's making a program that's teaching dog walking and business <laughs> development at the same time, unless it's one of right. our friends that does like, like I actually just uh, recorded with Nicole Begley, who oh, Nicole yeah. says hi, and she's teaching pet photographers. I was like, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe Nicole would talk about how to walk a dog effectively for the photography stuff, but I'm not sure if that would be in her wheelhouse. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, so I guess one of my last questions for you, I know that you have a whole program on how to coach more effectively so that clients can get better results, which honestly that yes, marketing is important and marketing strategy and messaging and all of that is very important. And I also strongly believe, and I would bet that you agree with me that being able to get clients results is probably more important because it's a lot easier to grow a program. Even if your marketing's kind of a little meh, like it could be better. That was me. If you, oh, my marketing sucks for a really long time. Well, she's great at it now. (laughs) I'm good at it now, but like the reason my business took off was not because I was a great marketer. It's because you were a great coach. Because I was a great coach. And people told their friends about me and their sisters and their Mm mother-in-laws and like word of mouth. Um, And then I got to be a better marketer and like now I'm able to do both, but I 100% agree. It's like, yeah. You're going to do well, one first, do the coaching, become a right, good coach. Right. And getting, getting, helping people get what they're paying for. Yes. Which, and actually that, I want to make sure we talk about the responsibility piece that you mentioned in the beginning, but helping people get what they are signing up for and making it not about your value as a person, but really making it like, is, are they actually going to get what they are signing up for if they do this program with high likelihood? Right. And so being really proficient at not only the content and the expertise, but also the coaching strategy to help people actually get results. If I was going to pick one to focus on, I would definitely start with that. And then the yeah. marketing can grow from totally. there. Right. And yeah. So I, well, can I share like a, I'm going to like back you up on this. Um, so I have had some, some breakthroughs in my business where, um, I tend to like hit some plateaus in my business and then have this like major breakthrough and my like launches explode. And then I like plateau there and then I like do it again. Um, and my, one of my first breakthroughs when I, I really like got into six figure launches, the, the thing that I can identify that changed between launch like five and launch six is I got to the place where I was 110% confident that whoever walked through my door, I could freaking coach them. And when I got to that level of confidence of like, I know if you join my program, I can freaking coach you. I got, I got this. And I could come from that place of certainty in my marketing. Like that's what shot my, my launches to the next level. And, mm-hmm. and so to your point is like, yes, 
marketing is important, but most of us don't, aren't sleazy marketers. Like most of us don't want to be sleazy marketers where we're just like super good at marketing. We don't care on the back end of like what mm-hmm. happens with our clients at that point. And so if you're that type of person who you're like, you have integrity and you want to serve people and you want people to actually get results. When you focus on becoming a better coach and up-leveling your coaching ability, it's going to translate into your marketing because you can come from a very confident place of your ability to help the person who's in front of you. And it just, it, it empowers your marketing so much more. Mm-hmm. Um, and it makes all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why in our NBA program, the first, at least half, maybe a little more than half of the program is focused on the offer and the service. So important. Cause it's like between the clarity of knowing what you're selling and the confidence that it you works. actually can help people. Yeah. But again, it's not a hundred percent. And I, this is maybe a good segue into that responsibility question but like believing that if, if you do this program and if you show up and if you take it seriously, cause you can't force people right. to yeah. show up and take action and, mm-hmm. you know, take advantage of the coaching that's available. If you do this, the result is highly, highly likely to happen. Right. Like having that confidence, I think can cover up for some mediocre marketing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, having testimonials and, client experiences where they can talk about how great the program was because they got results and because they felt taken care of, you know, that, like I said, can really be something that grows your business really effectively without you having to be this like master's level marketer. And not to say you you shouldn't learn marketing because, you know, we both are paying a lot of money to learn marketing strategies, but it's not marketing a junk program, right? It's like the program has to work Mm -hmm. for you to be able to sell it effectively and to feel good about it. At least yeah. my audience cares about that. I know yeah. your audience does too. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that ability to support people in the actual process of getting the results and not just have all of this great information, I think is so, so important as part of whether it's one-on-one or a group coaching program. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. So, so that segues me into my last question, because I know you and I could talk about this stuff for a very long time, but we'll we'll just try to put a little bow on it with this question. What is your perspective on the idea of responsibility for results? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think this is such a, it's such an important conversation. And, and I would say if you're not having this exact conversation with your clients, you're doing yourself and your clients a disservice. And I think that is wherever you choose to put that line as, as a coach doesn't matter as much as the fact that you communicate it and you guys are like, it's like a an agreement that you have, you know, in a marriage, like if I have expectations of my husband, but I don't actually communicate them, how can I really expect him to just like read my mind that causes problems. <laughs> and so I think it's the same thing in any sort of coaching relationship is like, you just need to get clear on that boundary of what is your responsibility, what is their responsibility, and then it needs to be communicated and agreed upon. And Mm -hmm. so on the very first call that I do with my clients, I do that as I set up like, this is my responsibility. It's my responsibility to keep a safe environment and, and to like kick anybody out who like starts to create an unsafe environment. That's my responsibility as a program creator. It's my responsibility as a program creator to address like any questions or any worries or any frustrations or any disappointments or anything that you have. That's my job as, as a coach. It's also my job as a coach to approach any conversation that I'm having with you from the perspective of you're bad and you can do this and your success is inevitable. And you're going to like, be able to like, it's my job to come from that perspective. Cause you're not always in that perspective. That's okay. I'll hold that space for you, um, as a coach. Um, and then I'm really clear, like, what is your responsibility as a client? Your responsibility as a client is to ask a question when you're confused, lost, confused, uh, behind overwhelmed, frustrated, discouraged, disappointed, like any of those negative emotions, you feel that that's your cue to ask a question because I can't read minds. Right. So I can't read your mind. <laughs> and I make that really clear. It's like, that's a line of demarcation. If you ask me a question, we will get it answered. I will get you clarity. That's my job, but I can't read your mind. And so you have to ask the question. Um, and we talk about, you know, taking action is like, I can't coach somebody who's not taking action, even just like the smallest little bit of action. I got you girl. But if you're sitting there 
crossing your arms, like sitting on the floor, metaphorically, not taking action or literally, or literally (laughs) I can't do anything. So, you know, I'm really clear right up front. And then I say, Hey, we have a 30 day, no, no questions asked refund policy. If you're not willing to like, if this doesn't sound good to you and you're like, Oh no, I can't, I can't abide by that. Like go get a refund, like straight up (laughs) right at the gate gate. Um, because, but when I've done that, like I've never had anybody be like, Oh my gosh, I can't handle that, that responsibility of asking a question when I have a question, Mm -hmm. um, you know, people like hear it and then I reinforce it. And I reinforce, I told you that writing down the question and then reminding them of their responsibility to go and get it answered. I help them to use cues of, um, I will say over and over, like when you're feeling a negative emotion, you're feeling stuck, frustrated, behind, confused, overwhelmed, like any of those negative emotions, that's your cue to go and get coaching. And if you choose not to do it, that's your choice. I can't, I can't force you into it, but that's the cue you're looking for. And so people like, they'll put that on their thing. They're like, I don't, I don't even know what my question is, but I'm feeling super confused and overwhelmed. And I just like need help. Cool. Even that I can coach you. I got you. I'll take it from here. I'll ask you questions. We'll get, we'll figure out why you're feeling so confused and overwhelmed. Um, but I can't read your mind. You gotta, you gotta at least say, you gotta raise your hand Mm -hmm. (laughs) for me to call on you and to, Mm -hmm. to help you through it. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think that's, that's my take is like, it's a balance. Of course Mm -hmm. you cannot be responsible. I'm not responsible for my clients of results. Um, I am very clear of what I am responsible for. I'm responsible for creating the container for coaching them through it, for answering their questions, all of those things I take full responsibility for. Um, but I can't do it for you. Mm -hmm. And, and that's that line in the sand. But I do think in the health industry, sometimes we go way far to the other side where we're like, well, I gave you the perfect macros and you didn't follow them. Mm -hmm. So shame on you. Yeah. And that to me is like, that's way too far of like putting the only responsibility on the client. Mm. Um, The thing that I have also learned over time, right? It's 15 iterations of this program later um, is that it also is my responsibility as a program uh, designer to notice where people are struggling and attempt to address it. You know, we had, um, one of the changes, we made this change maybe three or four launches ago where we had, we used to have like doors close on Thursday and like first call was on, on Monday. Cause people wanted to get going. They like wanted to like start taking action and, um, we would dive right in and like week one would start and we would, you know, whatever we kept getting so much feedback of like, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm so like, ah, like there's so much stuff going on. And I did like, ah, it's like already week two and I haven't done anything. And like all of these like, um, complaints of like people feeling overwhelmed and our refund rate was higher than I wanted it to be because I think Mm -hmm. people got in, they got overwhelmed, they fell behind. And so they refunded. Yeah. And, and, you know, I could have just said, well, overwhelm is a perspective. That's your, like you're choosing to be into overwhelm. And, um, you need to figure out how to get out of overwhelm. (laughs) You know, you can be that like hard, hard nosed and say, that's all your responsibility to be able to get out of overwhelm. But we didn't, we, we said, Hey, there's a lot of people that are feeling this way. What can we do to, to help that, to Mm -hmm. address it head on and not just expect them to be able to get over overwhelmed themselves. And so what we did is we implemented what we call prep week, um, where it's a week after we close cart it doesn't count towards their like eight weeks. So people don't feel like the clock is starting to tick already. And, um, we do a whole week on like how to get results in the program, how to use the program, how, like, where are the bonuses, how to like get the most out of coaching calls, how to like, when you feel behind and overwhelmed, how to, how, can I coach you through that? You know, like addressing all of these things that we were hearing people saying and our next launch, our refund rate cut in half just by, imp- just by like hearing that feedback, making an adjustment, trying to address it head on, mm-hmm. um, and support our clients in that way. And so I think as a program creator, you're not going to get it right. You're not going to get it right the first time and that's okay, but listen to your people, mm-hmm. listen to the feedback that you're getting and, and tweak and adjust and try and test and do new things. And, um, you know, see if it helps. Yeah. We implemented a new thing this time around. We're doing a new Q and a that we've never done before. And our refund rate has dropped a point, a whole percentage point this round. And it just is because we continue to ask, like, what do our clients need? Where are they getting stuck? What is coming up for them? Like what's holding them back from getting results? And is there Mm -hmm. anything that we can do on our end to support them through that? Yeah. 
I love that. I feel like that's that's that nice balance of not saying, oh, if 100% of the people in this program don't get the outcome, then my program's no good. But then also not saying, well, if they don't get the result, it's their fault. Right. Right. Yeah. Because I, I I do, I don't think that's so common with my clients. I think mine, Very common with the like fitness industry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Mine, mine tend to be more like, I'm not comfortable pro- like making a program promise because what happens if they don't get it? Yeah. And I get that, right? It's, it's yep. you know, it's scary to be like, what if they don't actually get the result that we're promising on our marketing? And so I do think having this mindset of wanting to do whatever it takes to maximize the chances mm-hmm. and constantly be willing, you know, Amber is 15 launches in, you're still looking at how can we make this yeah. better? How can we make this better? And it doesn't mean the program is bad. It doesn't mean that most people won't get results. But if you're still seeing some friction, you can be like, is there any way that we can fix this? Because yep. maybe there's not. And maybe it's like literally the friction we're seeing is, you know, something that's out of our control. But a lot of times it's something where you can look at how the program and curriculum is delivered yeah. so that people, <laughs> hey, hubby, uh, you, you guys can't see because you're on a podcast, but her husband just walked in, turns around, <laughs> walks out of her room. In so his all, scrubs, nonetheless. Yeah. <laughs> so all I was going to say is, um, yeah, just being willing to take that feedback and not take it as like personal criticism or right. assuming that that means people are unhappy with the program because a lot of times it's not actually that they want refunds or something. It's like they're just frustrated and they're blaming themselves because they think there's something wrong with them, that yeah. they're not getting results. And so if you can look at that and say, is there anything that we could do, try, experiment with to see if we can f- solve that issue and bake it into the co- the program itself, I think that's our responsibility. And then at the end of the day, like we can do everything that we can that's possible. And there's still going to be people that don't get the outcome and we have to be okay with that. Yeah. And just because they didn't get the outcome right now doesn't mean that they aren't a step closer to getting the outcome. Yeah. Or that you they'll, know? you know, they maybe they got 50% of the outcome and that was already worth it, yeah. right? Well, and that's what I I try to remind myself of that is like everybody has a different reason for signing up for programs. You know, I've signed up for programs and I'm like, I, I didn't really need the whole thing. I just needed this one part and I got that and I'm good to go. Like, and I, great. I'm happy I brought the program. Yeah. But if that program like designer was like, oh, well, she never asked a question or she never showed up to a live call or she, she like- must hate me. <laughs> she didn't She didn't finish the module. She must have not gotten any value. I'm like, no, I got what I needed. Like I was there for a very specific reason. And so I just think we, we can't, we have to remind ourselves, like, we don't know why that person is there. And we also don't know what stage of the journey. And my goal is always just to make, have people leave me a little better than when they came. Mm -hmm. And for some people that means losing 40 pounds. And for some people, it means having this idea, oh my gosh, that I can be successful. And if they leave, they didn't think that before. And now they think this, like, that's great. That's, you know, just creating this like one definition of success is, is really short-sighted as a business owner. Mm -hmm. Um, and allow clients to have their individual definition of success of what success is inside of your program. And it doesn't have to be your definition of success. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say we could do a mic drop, but both of us are using mic stands. So (laughs) we'll just have to imagine that. Um, Well, Amber, it's been so fun to talk to you as always. And um, I would love if you just want to take a minute to share about your program for supporting coaches and health professionals that want to get better at coaching yeah. Because obviously this is something that you've spent a lot of time learning and you you have a new program. I don't know. Actually, is it new, new? I'm trying to think like it's how like, new it's it like is. It's a year and a half old. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. It's, it's new not compared a, to Macros 101. I was going to say not as seasoned <laughs> as Macros 101, but it's uh, it's definitely not a brand yeah. new program. But yeah. um, if you want to just share how you help people in that program get better yeah. at coaching and yeah. we can make sure they know how to find you. Yeah. So we started Coaching Academy um, about a year and a half ago and have... Um, coach or trained now, um, over 70 new coaches in learning how to really dig to the root of the problem. Um, we like to call it transformational coaching. Um, I see a lot of coaches who are, are, uh, teachers and they think that teaching is coaching, or they think that advice giving is coaching, or that they think that cheerleading is coaching. Um, and in reality, none of those uh, in and of themselves are going to get people actually transformational results. Mm-hmm. They made the kind of the band aid right on the symptom. And so I've, um, I help clients or coaches to be able to get to that root cause. What is the root cause of what's keeping this person stuck? Why, why are you giving them a really perfectly great program and they're not following it? Um, why do they start and then stop and then restart again? Why are they like having that like devil on one side and the angel on the other? And how do you rectify those two? Um, is helping to teach 
coaches how to get to that root cause. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we do that in what we call coaching Academy and, um, it's a, a mentorship program where I work, work pretty closely with coaches to teach them and let them practice and, you know, have, you know, they do a, a case study. So we're able to like help them work through actual real clients and real in the moment type coaching. And, um, it's been really fun. And, and, uh, the coaches who have gone through it just, one of the coaches, she, she just told us, um, she was coaching clients before she joined coaching Academy. And then she went through coaching Academy and she had one of those clients come back, uh, to get some more coaching from her. And her client is like, Oh my gosh, it's like night and day. Like your coaching is like night and day. She, she didn't even tell the client she had gone through this thing, but she was like, what is, what's so different? Like you, your coaching has changed. It's so much more effective. And you know, this coach was like, yeah, you know, I learned a new way of like actually being really effective with my clients. So mm-hmm. anyway, that's what we do inside of coaching Academy. Um, we open doors a couple times a year. So if that's something you're interested in hearing more about, you can go to bicepsafterbabies.com forward slash cert C E R T for short for certification and, um, look at when coaching Academy is opening next. Amazing. Well, we'll, we will definitely put the link to that in the show notes for this episode. So if you guys want to go to lauraschoenfeld.com, I'm sorry, lauraschoenfeldrd.com. I always mix that up because I have two different websites, which is getting more confusing as time goes on. Um, But if you want to check out the podcast page and just search for Amber's name, you'll be able to find that in the show notes in case you need any help getting that link. But Amber, thank you so much for coming on. It was so fun to chat with you. And um, I'm always inspired by what you're doing. And uh, I know that you know, just how successful your clients are in the macros 101 program. If you can help people do that same type of work, that it's going to be very impactful for your students. Yeah. Well, you're a rock star. Thanks for letting me come on and, and chat. This has been super fun. Yay. Well, thank you to all of you for hanging out with us. And we'll see you here next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care, everybody. Hey there, Laura here again. If you're anything like the hundreds of health and nutrition entrepreneurs that I've worked with over the past few years, you want to create an efficient, structured, and organized online health office that saves you time, maximizes your impact and your income, and provides a great experience for your clients. But maybe you've been told falsely that all you need is free tools like Google Calendar and Google Drive to make that happen. Or maybe you know that you need to use a client management software like Practice Better, but you feel overwhelmed trying to figure out how to set it up in a way that actually saves you time rather than wasting it. Either way, the fact is you need a well-oiled client management system, one that works for you like a team member if you want to have a successful online health and nutrition business. And in my brand new free training, I'm going to teach you the six essential steps to set up practice better for a more profitable and efficient virtual health and wellness business. I'll give you the step-by-step system for setting up your client management software that will get you out of the day-to-day admin work and back into the role of the high-level health and nutrition professional where you belong. I'll also show you how my client Jackie used these exact principles to help her make over $200,000 in revenue in her first full year of business while also preparing to become a first-time mom. And by the end of this 60-minute training, you'll finally know the best way to create an efficient, structured, and organized online health office that saves you time, maximizes your impact and income, and provides an amazing front-end experience for your clients and customers. To get access to this exclusive brand new training, go to practicebettertraining.com and select the training day and time you'd like to attend. And don't worry if you can't make any of the times listed. We'll be sending the replay to all registrants. So just be sure to look for an email from hello at lauraschoenfeldrd.com to get your personal link to join the training. Having a well-organized client management system is a non-negotiable when it comes to building a financially successful online health business that doesn't burn you out. And I can't wait to show you the exact steps to doing so in the fastest and most efficient way possible. Go to practicebettertraining.com to sign up now, and I look forward to seeing you on the training.